Gerlindy's from Austria. So she got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost in Austria. Then moved to Phoenix, so uh, she hooked, found us and we're good friends. So we'll probably have uh, people from Australia and just all, no telling where yeah. all they'll come from. In just a few minutes. Well, maybe it's time to start. Can you get us started, uh, Patricia? I can. And Howard, why don't you open us up in prayer? Okay. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, please fill us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, and show us the very most for complete understanding within your will. Lord, please bless the speaker with a special anointing. Lord, and we look to you to lead our way in this special time that we're in. Lord, um, we also ask you to bless the president and his legal advisors, Lord, that the Supreme Court will reflect the way you run the courts of heaven, Lord. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, we welcome everybody that's here. And of course, a lot of people know that we, we videotape this, uh, these Zoom meetings, and we put them up on YouTube. And I've already had a number of people that say, hey, I'm going to catch you on the, on the YouTube. Because, uh, you know, people are uh, busy catching up with the news. It's hard. It's hard to catch up. It's, it's flying so fast. But uh, anyhow, we have faith and confidence that God's will is going to be done. The Christians, I believe, have stood up and prayed. And we know his, God wants his will to be done on this earth as it is in heaven. But anyhow, we're real excited to have Vidgar. Uh, and, and we met uh, Sunday. He's, he's a good friend of our pastor, Dave Kramer, who's next week's speaker, by the way. And and Dave, uh, they have a lot in common. They're old buddies, and they uh, both work for Kenneth Hagen Ministries, which most of us have uh, have uh, enjoyed being tutored by Brother Hagen and uh, his uh, ministry and revelation, and brought us closer to uh, you know the level where we can walk in a higher level than uh, most most of Christianity around the world. Uh, so anyhow, Full Gospel Businessmen has been around for 70 years. This is the Phoenix chapter, and uh, we've been given prophecies that, that we're going to go all over the world and preach the gospel. Uh, Amen. Phoenix, Arizona. Amen. Hey, Lynn, yep. from uh, Perth, Hi. Australia. Yeah, good to be with you. I love you bunch. I think you're awesome. Amen. Well, we enjoy you being being here. You're you're gonna you're gonna really enjoy tonight. And I don't want to uh, belabor the belabor the point, but if anybody wants to be a member of our chapter, you're well. You know, we're, you can find us on on uh, Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on our website. Uh, if anybody feels led of the Lord to give to our chapter. We really haven't taken a collection up uh, officially in about six months since we've gone underground or I guess in, in, in a Zoom meetings. Uh, so we finally, I want to let you know that we finally have a button or a um, ability to collect uh, offerings on, on, uh, uh, on a credit card. So we're in the process of uh, putting that up on, uh, on our uh, website, maybe on Facebook too. And so if you want to help us to, we, we always want to bless the speakers. And, uh, you know, we do have uh, bills to pay. And we're looking forward to, to having some meetings where we can get together. And our next speaker is going to be, uh, he was mentored by the uh, Azusa Street Saints, and his name is Brother Tommy Welchel. 
and he wrote a book, a book, a couple books about the miracles on Azusa Street, which is uh, most Pentecostals, we look towards Azusa Street where they had, that's not the, the first moving of the Holy Spirit, but the, that's one most of the Pentecostal charismatic renewal came, they can uh, trace their steps back to Azusa Street, amen. So, uh, I mean, we're talking about mighty, mighty miracles. Of course, we need to see miracles today. And uh, I know, Victor, you can talk about in third world nations, you see more, at least when I went over there, I mean, these people, they can't go to the doctor, you know, and uh, they don't have the money to, they don't have the medical insurance we have, so they have to believe God. So they, you see quicker miracles, mighty miracles, because they don't have anywhere else to turn. We can go and, uh, you know, let our insurance pay. And uh, sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad, you know. But anyhow, it's exciting to have Vigor here. Um, Vigor, why don't you, um, you sent me uh, some of your bio, and I didn't realize you came from a long line of Pentecostals from Norway. And we don't, you know, this is the first time we've had a, uh, Pentecostal minister from Norway. And uh, why don't you tell a little bit about your background, your grandfather, your father, how you, you know, were influenced by Kenneth Hagin. We are sort of sponsoring or we're spotlighting Kenneth Hagin ministry because I'm sure if we look at it, it's Kenneth Hagin's ministry and his, uh, what he's found out the hard way has, has uh, influenced all of our lives. And now we're, instead of being down here, we're up here, you know, because we, we've studied his revelation. And, uh, and my goodness, Vigor, you've, uh, you've been influenced by Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin and a lot of other mighty men of God. So, so why don't you share with us about, a little bit about your testimony and background. How did you get, how did you, get a, you know, to, to Rama Bible College? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to share some of that. Um, like you mentioned, a long line of uh, both my wife and myself, we're both uh, third generation Pentecostal. All of our grandparents were part of the early Pentecostal revival there uh, in Norway. Uh, my grandfather, he, he taught the very same uh, Sunday school class for 50 years. Then uh, one of my uncles, he pioneered the very first uh, spirit-filled church or Pentecostal church on the island of Malta where Paul was shipwrecked. Uh, one of my wife's uncles, she was, uh, they were in Congo when the Rwanda genocide broke out and they kind of had to flee, flee that situation. So lots of uh, deacons, uh, bivocational pastors, uh, missionaries, that's kind of our uh, heritage and, and upbringing there. And then in the late 70s, um, my father was working for the largest charismatic ministry in Norway at the time. They were in a town of, I don't know, maybe a thousand people in that town. And they would have about 10,000 people coming to their camp meetings. So every yard in the whole town was just filled with tents and campers and, and cars. And it was just um, traffic uh, congestion galore when, when they had their camp meetings. You can imagine, uh, but they had a printing press, and uh, at, the, at the end of the 70s, they took Brother Hagen's books, translated to the Norwegian language. So I was eight years old, uh, just learning to read, I guess, and uh, one of the first books I ever read was I Believe in Visions. And of course, I'd grown up Pentecostal, so knew about healings, um, you know, I could relate to people with testimonies and that kind of a thing. But reading through Brother Hagen's book, I, I remember I came to this sentence where he said, um, I haven't had a headache since 1933. And even as an eight-year-old, that, that phrase just kind of jumped off the page and, and hit me. And I thought, man, he, he must be knowing something that the people I'm hanging around don't. Because even though we believe in healings and believe in miracles, it, it seems to be this kind of a hit and miss thing. And nobody knows the answer to why. And here it seems to be somebody who's got uh, more than a hit and miss experience with healing. So he, he must be knowing something. So ever since then, um, I had a desire to, to come to Tulsa. 
of course, Tulsa, Oklahoma is uh, not too known uh, inside the United States. When you move out of the country, the whole world, the Christian world, seems to know about Tulsa because you've got T.L. Osborne that really impacted so many countries around the world. You've got Ora Roberts, you've got Kenneth Hagin, and uh, pretty much most charismatic ministers that, that travel internationally, they've got some kind of a Tulsa story in their, in their sermon repertoire. So you get to hear the name of the town all the time. And so I had this strong desire then to, to come to Tulsa. And so um, when I was in eighth grade, I believe it was, we were presented with an opportunity to become a foreign exchange student in the United States. And I wanted to come to Tulsa. So I signed up and, uh, you know, eighth grade. So my parents are thinking, yeah, we'll see what comes of this, you know. Just <laughs> Well, I was serious. Uh, I got accepted, but the program didn't have any placement in Tulsa. So I ended up writing to uh, Pastor Billy Joe Doherty, Victory Christian Center, uh, Victory Christian School in Tulsa. And now they found me a host family and I came to high school in Tulsa. And then since then, I spent a good number of years training then high school, uh, Rainbow Bible College with Kenneth Hagen, of course. And then I went through Oral Roberts University as well. So it became, uh, uh, Tulsa became a very strong training ground for me. Wow, that's amazing. Amazing story. Uh, and um, then you, you hooked up with uh, Kenneth Hagen Ministry and uh, went through Rama, and I guess they liked you, so they hired you. Uh, so tell us about your Rama story and your interaction with the, the Hagans. Yeah, you know, having, having grown up in Pentecost, um, you know, the things of the Holy Spirit were not totally unfamiliar, but uh, going through school um, and sitting at the conferences, you know, the camp meetings, the winter Bible seminars and so forth, it just, it just propelled me to new levels in life. And, um, I really felt strongly when I was through with college, I got my uh, master's in business as well from, from ORU, but felt strongly I was to help out uh, the Hagen family. So I came on board with them and, and helped them in various capacities, both in the church and on the ministry side. Um, and so there was a lot of learning there. And of course we, we were able to rub shoulders with a lot of the technology people at the various ministries um, around the country as well. Um, but I remember one particular, um, we were doing some kind of a mail out, you know, all these big ministries, they have uh, a partner program and that, you know, you mail out monthly letters and this kind of a thing. And I remember we were sitting in a planning meeting and, um, we were going to mail out the mailing to people we hadn't heard for from in a long time, you know, behind the scenes, you call it lapsed donors. You haven't heard from them in maybe one year, two years, three years, something like this. And we wanted to reach out to them and, and um, somebody came up with the idea, well, let's just send them a letter, a, a nice letter from the executive office and say, hey, we're thinking of you. I think this was might have been in 2008. So a lot of people financially hit that type of a thing and just send them a letter and ask if, if everything's OK and if they ha you have any prayer requests. And I remember Pastor Hagen, uh, Kenneth Hagen Jr., some of you might know him as, um, sitting in that meeting and he said, well, I'm old school. And so if, if we're going to write them a letter saying that I am going to pray for them, then you need to change the mail flow because the mail flow at the ministry was that all prayer requests would go to the prayer and healing center. Like same thing with or Roberts university and all the prayer requests, it goes to the prayer tower. Well, they went to the prayer and healing center at Kenneth Hagen Ministries, and, but Pastor Hagen piped up and said, if you're writing a letter giving people the impression that I'm going to personally pray for them, then you cannot send those prayer requests to the prayer and healing center. You have to reroute and send it to my desk because if I'm promising something and my signature is on that piece, then I'm going to fulfill what I promised and I will personally pray for all those prayer requests. And I thought, wow, that, that is a level of integrity that, that you don't always see behind the scenes in many of these big ministries. It's, you know, well, it, it'll be all right. You know, it's just a mail piece going to the partners. We're just trying to get a hold of these lapsed donors. You know, that it becomes easy to look at just the business side of things. But um, 
that's something that's always stood out to me with the Hagen family that they really have endeavored that um, a word is a word and you don't need something unsigned. If, if we have promised something, then we need to bring that, make sure that we fulfill what we have said we will do. And so, you know, those, those type of stories just become part of, of training. Um, I remember we had a snowstorm blowing through there as well. And uh, uh, once again, Pastor Hagen, he's the first one to pick up a broom. You know, he, he never had the mentality that I'm, I'm above any kind of a job in the ministry. It, it became one, you know, every single office worker was out and we had to take care of snow situations and get the church back open. There was a lot of snow on the roof there and, and uh, it was just a precarious situation. So, you know, those are things that, that you learn from and glean from and take with you as, as, as you do ministry yourself. Wow. So tell us about, you, you know, it sounds like you got a call from the Holy Spirit to go to Kenya. So tell us a little bit about your call what got you out of your comfort level there in Tulsa, which you, uh, you know, you considered the Mecca of uh, Christianity. Why would you want to go to the third world nation of, uh, you know, and go and, you know, pioneer or work in Kenya? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And um, actually it goes back to even before I came to the United States. Um, I think this might've been, uh, I think I was about six years old. Um, and Reinhard Bonke's name was just starting to become known in Europe at this time. He had just gotten one of these big tents. I heard about it. And um, ever since I was about six years old, my heart was burning for Africa. And so I always really viewed Tulsa as, as a training ground uh, to become a missionary going, going to Africa. And so then it was just a, um, you know, endeavoring to follow the Lord, follow the leading of his Holy Spirit, and um, knowing that this is training ground. And of course, when I'm working for the Hagen family, I'm there to do a good job as well. But at the same time, I know that a time is coming when the time is right for us to launch out the move over to Africa. So we had our firstborn daughter. She was five months old, and um, we were signed at uh, Kenneth Hagen Ministries, and we moved over to Kenya. That was in uh, 2006. When we started the ministry there. What was your goal when you uh, went over there? I guess, it were, what, did they have a work going? And uh, I know you, you got involved in starting churches and uh, training the, uh, the African, uh, I guess, pastors or people that are called. Tell us a little bit about what you found when you got there and, and how that worked out. Yeah, sure. So, so I had started going to, to Africa in 1999, and the first few trips over there was more of a reconnaissance, you know, trying to understand what kind of ministries were already on the ground, what type of work was being done, and um, observing what the needs were. And uh, I knew that teaching was, was part of the calling, so we would start out doing seminars in churches, but doing seminars in churches, I quickly realized that um, unless the senior pastor is on board with what you're teaching, you're not going to have very much long-term effects. You might help a few people, but, but the longevity of what you're doing is not really there. So we switched over to doing leadership seminars. And we went rural. There's been a lot of ministry done in, in Nairobi. In fact, I, I often say that uh, pretty much every, every evangelist known to man has had a crusade in their movie at some point or another. Um, so that, that, they've had a lot of influence, but the rural areas are, are often neglected. So we started leadership training there and we would do like three days, one week leadership seminars. But I also quickly realized that you're not going to train leaders, senior leaders over churches in a week's time. And you might have another group coming in that'll teach something slightly different than that type of thing. And everybody's sincere and trying to help out, but they really need a curriculum from, from A to Z so you can really train these people. And so after one of these trips, I was sitting on the plane on the way home and I thought, I've got myself a prayer project. I'm going to pray that somebody will bring them a, a full Bible school. Well, I'm sitting there in a plane seat, and, and I heard, well, you're asking for laborers. Uh, why don't you be one? Why don't you go and do what you're praying about? 
<laughs> so that became the beginning then of starting what we were calling a safari Bible school at the time. And it was really just a Bible school in a suitcase going from town to town. But we would keep on going back to the same town uh, some months later to make sure that we would complete a full curriculum and really train these pastors. And uh, we started seeing some tremendous results. We had a lot of pastors that came to us and they had 20, 30, 40 members when they came. And a couple of years after they'd gone through our program, very often they're 200, 300 members. So we saw a lot of, a lot of tremendous growth. And so that was in the beginning of, of the ministry. Um, SafariMission.org is, is the ministry. And then uh, once we'd been going a little while, when then we, we joined forces with Rama Bible Training College. And so today in Kenya, we have nine campuses that are Rama Bible Training College campuses in, in Kenya. Uh, some of you might might know, might not, I don't know, but, but Rama Bible Training College, of course, was started in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Today, um, we have campuses in 50 nations, and we're over 250 campuses around the world. So it has really grown a whole lot the last 20 years. So sometimes you, you or a lot of times, sounds like your model is to find people they want to learn more about the word and they're called into the ministry, but they don't know what to do and where to go. And so they enter into your curriculum at Rama Bible College there in Kenya. And then, then what do you do with them? I mean, they go and learn, is it a one year or a two year course over there? And then what do you do? Where do they go after they get trained? Yeah, so it's it's a two-year program that, that we bring them through. Um, but, of course, I've, I've got a little bit of background in business as well. I've got an MBA from Oral Roberts University. So we're able to bring in some, some leadership principles. And um, one of the big principles that, that we really drill into them is, um, and I tell these pastors, I say, um, you know, a church that is a missions receiving church is not yet a mature church because a mature church will always be a missions sending church. And so I tell them, I, I don't care if you have 2000 members, but if, if you're predominantly looking for somebody coming from America to help you out in whatever capacity, you know, there's nothing wrong with somebody helping you out. But if, if you're getting more help than the help you're giving, then you're still in your infancy. You know, an adult, a child, they're always looking for somebody to help them and they're helpless, they need help. But when you reach adulthood, you become a caretaker of children. And so we, we really take this principle of um, not just giving them fish. Um, you know, you can give somebody a pair of shoes and it'll wear out in three months. And during those three months, they're looking for somebody else to give you a coat. And so, you know, you're, you're just feeding the, the hand me out something mentality um, when, when you're doing that. So we are very big on helping people to understand that you need to become a producer in society. And uh, with God in you, with, with the scripture in you, the word of God in you and, and the Holy Spirit in you, you really have what it takes to be a positive influence in your society. So you need to focus on you being a positive influence and what others do that you can help them to become a positive influence, but, but make sure that you have something to answer for uh, when you stand before Jesus one day. Well, can you tell us a couple of examples of, of how you've mentored some of these pastors and it's changed their life and some of the people have taken the word of God uh, that you've taught or you've learned from Kenneth Hagin to go out there and bring it into practicality because I think a lot of us have seen people that are, you know, they, they want a handout, but yet, you know, they don't know what to do to, uh, you know, be productive in society and the, in the, in the world that we live in. Yeah, sure. There, there are plenty of stories and I'll just give you a, a, a couple real quick. One is, um, we open a campus out on the Somali border, which of course Somalia is overran by Al Qaeda or their affiliate Al, Al Shabaab, and they spill over into the Kenya side of the border. So 
there's some security problems there. And um, the town that uh, we set up, uh, set up in, they hadn't really had a whole lot of outside influence the last 30 years. And so a lot of wrong mentality, a lot of things, both theologically and entrepreneurship wise that needed to be cleaned up and they needed help with. But we did that over, over a period. And um, the pastors there that we raised, they said, wow, if these people have the courage to come all the way here where everybody else is saying it's, it's dangerous, then surely we can go from this little town and we can go further out. And so many of those ministers, instead of looking for somebody else coming from Nairobi to help them out, they started to become productive. And many of them started churches out in villages on the Somali border that there's never been a church in the history of those villages, many of them. And we continue to get reports coming in um, that they're now planning churches in those areas. So that's, that's a very good result. Um, one more recent this year, the, the shutdown in Kenya has been harder than in the United States. Um, all commercial air traffic has been closed and they have not even been able to travel from county to county. And so, and you ask, what do you do with alumni when they're done? Uh, we have a church coaching program. And I think probably many of you know from business as well that, you know, in sports, you have a coach in business. Very often you have some kind of a mentor or, or a coach. And uh, for some reason, it's not very common in the church world. But we have a coaching program where we help alumni after they're done with school. And so um, one, of the, one of the churches that we coached this year, um, it's about 350 members. They had 38 families that lost all of their income during during the shutdown this year and of course there's no twelve hundred dollar check from the federal government it's when it's gone it's gone and so that particular church they they started feeding uh, these families and i started working with them they couldn't meet on sundays but they did have a somewhat of a small groups program so we really focused on strengthening communications then with their small groups and uh, early on, I looked at the story of Isaac, you know, and over in Genesis, it talks about Isaac and, and it says it, he sowed in the year of famine and reaped that year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Actually, he wanted to go to Egypt and the Lord says, no, I called you to Canaan's land to stay put. You know, he's looking for natural opportunities and there's a bigger opportunity in, in, in Egypt, it looks like. And, but he's obedient. He does what the Lord says. He stays put in Canaan. But I've heard that story so many times during offering time. And there are plenty of scriptures that talk about, you know, giving to the work of the Lord. But as I start looking at the story, I realize, you know, Isaac, he didn't give to Melchizedek. He didn't give to the priests. In fact, he didn't give to the work of the Lord at all. He sowed into his own farm. In today's world, we would call that he invested into his own business in a year when it's difficult. It's called taking risk. It's called engaging in the, in the opportunity that is there, even, even when it's difficult. So I'm working with this pastor and I said, you need to get this message into your members, that they need to reach out and look for whatever opportunity they can find. They need to engage in that opportunity. Within weeks, um, those members, they found jobs. Many of them who couldn't find a job, they started businesses. And some even got their businesses to the point that they're hiring employees. All 38 families, they're putting food on their own table. And the church doesn't even need the feeding program anymore for their own members. Well, instead, then the church takes the feeding program. And they start helping people that are hard hit in the community. Now they have a strong small group. So people are looking at their neighbors and who can we really help in all this. So the end of the story there is that during the shutdown, this church it grew from 350 members to 650 members when they can't even meet on Sunday. And it wasn't because somebody kept on giving them shoes. It was because they, they were taught the principle of working with their hands and engaging in, in opportunities. Uh, this particular pastor and all churches in the whole area started coming to him. And so, he became a coach for 15 other churches in that whole region, helping to train them on and their members on how to engage in opportunities, how to strengthen their small group programs. And so we're seeing a lot of churches in that region just, just growing through the pandemic. So good things can come out of hardships. If, if, if we just look at 
what are the solutions instead of getting our heads stuck on the problem? You know, if we just focus on the problem, then we're enlarging the problem. But if we go, okay, well, it is what it is, and the government is doing what it's doing now, what's the solution? How can we pivot from all of this, and how can we do something different and grow through all of it? And we've seen a tremendous number of people grow through all of this. You know, that sort of reminds me of multi-level marketing a little bit. I mean, everybody's helping everybody, you know, to be successful. And it's a sort of a team, uh, you know, I guess that's, that's sort of uh, where multi-level marketing got, you know, the, got it from the Lord, didn't he? Yeah, or, or you can compare it also to, to disciples. You know, Jesus had the inner circle of three, and then there was the 12, and then there was the 70, and it just kept on going out from there. And from the 70, we got to the 120, and on the day of Pentecost, that became thousands. You know, you uh, you said something. I uh, had the pleasure of, uh, you know, you come into our church in uh, Chandler, Arizona. And, uh, you know, I really, you know, I'm a businessman. I'm a mortgage banker i've owned mortgage companies <clears throat> and it seems like we we all reach a sort of a glass ceiling where we can't get over you know you know we set goals but it's hard to to get over uh in our comfort level and uh you know and most of us when you're you have enough you know you sort of stop and get a little lazy and i know you uh you have uh, taught other things how to how to break through that glass ceiling. That's not really a ceiling; it's a mental attitude. So, anyhow, I want you to get into that, and because we're going to have a lot of business people that are online or they're going to be watching this, and uh, and, and I know in your own life you uh, you you had to examine yourself and find out how to how to get out of your uh, how to get you had to break, break through, uh, I guess, the uh, limitations that you, you were at. So t talk to us yeah. about that philosophy. Sure. Uh, and I think there is a, there's a couple of things there. Um, one is over in, and I'll read this in um, Hebrews chapter 10, which, of course, that prefaces uh, the hall of faith. Hebrews 10 verse 35 talks about, don't throw away your confidence, which is great reward. For you have need of endurance when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay. And so we're looking forward to Jesus coming back and is coming soon. And so the work we're doing is, is urgent. But in verse 38, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And you know, as, as I go through all the stories in Hebrews chapter 11, or you go through all the Old Testament heroes of faith, uh, I cannot find a biblical example of somebody who's coasting. I can't find a biblical example of somebody who is in maintenance mode. And, you know, when, when you start a business or you start a ministry, you start a church, it's all very similar. Um, it takes a ton of energy uh, to get started. It's kind of like getting a plane off the ground. And it takes, you know, it, it's full throttle. Uh, you, you, you eat, sleep, and drink this thing. And, and you do everything you can to get that plane off the ground. And, of course, once the plane is off the ground, then, then things start getting easier and easier as, as you progress. And it becomes very easy to, to go to a plateau. We see this a lot of times with pastors. You know, when you start getting to 150 members thereabout, you start getting to the point where a senior pastor can live off of the income that the church provides him. And so it becomes easy to plateau there because you've struggled for so long just to get to that point. You've spent maybe five years, maybe 10 years and pulling your hair out. You've been praying holes in your knees. I don't know what you've done. Um, and so it becomes easy to, to relax a little bit. Uh, well, if you relax, then um, that's not in line with the spirit of faith. Um, we are those who are of faith and we do not shrink back. So I think one of the principles there is as long as we are on this earth, we should always be having a vision 
to do more because there is an urgency. The Lord is coming. And you might say, and on the in, in business, I've heard from a lot of people that you know, when personal income starts reaching around three hundred thousand dollars a year, somewhere around there, you know, you start getting to to a level where it's possible to live pretty comfortable, and and you can stay there, or you can say, you know what, if I do more, then I can be a greater blessing to more people, and we can see the kingdom of God expand even further. And so we need to allow that to be a vision that, that propels us. Now, so, so I had that. Um, we had grown the schools. We were at um, 70 students. And so, and we had, you know, you, you heard some of the stories. I've got a long list of stories. We could spend much time talking about those. But, um, you know, so in, in many people's eyes, there is, there is a level of success there. But I'm frustrated because we're at 70 students and my vision is bigger than that. And so, you know, we trialed and maybe change up a marketing method a little bit to see if we can break to 100. And next year we're at 70. I go, well, maybe we need to change up uh, personnel a little bit. Maybe we need to get somebody else in that, in that chair. Next year we're at 70. You know, after this goes on for three or four years, you get frustrated and, um, you know, you got this internal conflict and um, you start looking at circumstances and, well, well, let's make some excuses. Well, Kenya must be a hard place. You know, there's been so many names coming through Nairobi. T.D. Jakes has been there. Kreflo Dollar has been there. Uh, Kenneth Hagen has been there. Oral Roberts has been there. Reynard Bonk has been there. Everybody's been there. And so when you bring in something in, everybody's going, well, what you got because we've got all these other stuff around here and and so you go well let's make that an excuse and so i started looking at some other bible colleges on the continent uh, that were doing better than us and i go man it must be nice to be in the environment that they are in and so you see now you start comparing environments and you start blaming environments for where you are and I started looking at a third Bible college as well, and I go, man, must be nice to be the director of that one because everything is so much easier, and they're bigger. But then I started, you know, I've got a little bit of business training, so I go, uh, what would my five-year plan look like if I were to take over one of those? And I go, I can see they're better off, and I don't really know what changes I would make. You know, if you don't make a change, everything is going to remain status quo. You'll be in maintenance mode. And when you're in maintenance mode, you're actually in decline. You know, things will slowly just, you're either going up or you're going down. And I said, if I don't, if I can't put together a five-year plan for what changes to make, it means I'm in maintenance mode if I were to take one of those bigger schools. And I thought, uh oh, that's not good. And I started imagining some of these other pioneers taking over the schools that we have in Kenya. And I knew them fairly well. So I, I, some of the changes that they would make, I, I knew. And there were changes I didn't like. You know, you, you may have to be a little bit firm, more firm with the employees and make sure you get your work done on time. And you might have to stick to deadlines a little bit more. And uh, you might have to maybe get up in the morning a little bit before the time you're used to getting up in the morning. But I realized that the schools in Kenya would start growing if one of those directors were to take the school in Kenya. So I'm looking in the mirror one morning and, and I realized, you know what? I have just found the problem. Because if you put another director in Kenya, it's going to grow. And if you place me in one of those other schools that's bigger than us, it's going to shrink. And I realized if you take a business person who's over a small $100,000 company and put them over a million dollar enterprise, they're going to do a pretty good job shrinking that thing. If you take somebody who's at a million every year and you put them over something that's $100,000, they will immediately start looking at ways to grow that $100,000 enterprise. So everything starts and stops with leadership. And I realized I was the problem. So I took one year and I threw out all of our goals. I said, I'm not going to set a single goal this year except for one. And I said, I'm going to focus on personal growth and personal development. And I started devouring books and I started asking questions. What do I need to change 
in order that I grow personally. And I've noticed, you know, we're, we're a landlord as well. And I noticed that when I have a tenant with gold on the inside, they're going to increase the value of my property. And if I have a tenant that doesn't really have the character on the inside, they're going to decrease the value of my property. And so I realized my properties, they increase and decrease in value in accordance with what's on the inside of the tenant. Because they, people bring their circumstances around them up or down in accordance with who they are. And so I realized if I don't like the circumstances I'm having in life, it's not the circumstances that's the problem. It's me that's the problem. Sure, I can't control every single circumstance 100%, but by and large, all of us are in the situation we are because of our own choices. Uh, I know Brother Philip here, is a, I think he was a neurosurgeon. I don't believe Brother Philip became a neurosurgeon just haphazardly. I, I think there was a career path that you had to choose and you made some choices that put yourself in that life situation. We're all in a life situation because of the choices we've made. And so I took a hard look at myself and started asking some really hard questions. It was, it was a difficult day, but it was also liberating because I realized the problem is one I have control over. I can do something about it. Well, I took one year personal growth and the following year we grew to 130 and 170 then 200, and now we're at 250 students there in Kenya. And uh, we have brought the operation in Kenya to the point that all the regular expenses in Kenya are paid by Kenyan income. So it's a missions organization in Kenya that is self-funded. We have all Kenyan leadership. And my time um, administratively is reduced about five, six hours a week. So my time now is focused on expansion into Uganda and Congo because Kenya can operate itself. Tell us a little bit about uh, the Congo. I mean, I saw you had, and you had some pictures. We don't, don't have time to show those pictures, but my goodness, their infrastructure is, looks like it's terrible. I mean, they've... Uh, misappropriated a lot of their wealth and, you know, haven't put money into their, you know, into their, their country. And uh, so what are your goals or what's the Holy Spirit talking to you about going down to the Congo now that you've sort of got Kenya self-sustaining, you know, tell us a little bit about what God's talking to you about in the Congo. Yeah. So, so we already have a campus on the Somali border, which is, relatively difficult uh, security situations and, and poverty we're dealing with there but uh, the Congo is it's approximately uh, Florida to New York uh, the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi not quite half the United States but it's a very sizable piece of land uh, with virtually no infrastructure there's a little bit in the capital but uh, and there's about 30 million people around Kinshasa, but the rest of the country has another 50 million people with no infrastructure. Mm. And um, I can show you some pictures and some videos, but even that doesn't do justice to what it's like being in there. Uh, the major highways, and I mean, you know, major highways between cities were put in pretty much in the 60s. They're all dirt roads. They go through rainforests. When you have zero maintenance on a dirt road going through a rainforest, and you got, you know, trucks and 18 wheelers passing there in the rainforest, you can imagine what that looks like after just one year. Well, fast forward 20 years, you're not going through there if you don't have, on a truck, you need six wheel drive. A four wheel drive isn't sufficient. Um, Rainer Bonke's equipment actually was six wheel trucks that was specially ordered by, by Gaddafi back in the day. Um, but anyways, that's, that's another story, but it's just incredible what the, the kind of equipment you need to, to get through in there. Um, we had teams in um, last year, only going about 30 miles into Congo from the Uganda border. And every two or three miles, there is a roadblock. 
manned in some cases by police officers that have not been paid by the government in 20 years. Well, you know, there's no other way to feed a police officer that, you know, he needs to help himself a little bit with the roadblock. So every two or three miles, you're going to pass when you have negotiated your fee for passing. And the more of a hurry you're in, the higher the fee is going to be because everybody can see you're in a hurry to get this negotiation over with. And so you need a good dose of patience. And so it, it, those 30 miles, it took all day. And now you're talking about country, uh, Florida to New York, the Atlantic to, to the Mississippi, with that kind of infrastructure. Um, well, I never read going to all the world, especially if there's a health and available. I'm a firm believer that when, when the light of the gospel goes forth and it will bring, you know, we call it the full gospel here, but to me, the full gospel also includes economic development. Uh, the light is always going to bring development and the truth will always bring development. And if we can bring that, then um, after a while, Hilton's going to be coming after us. But we're the pioneers going into places like that. Wow, that's amazing. And we, uh, we all admire you for taking on those challenges. Um, can, you, can you compare a little bit? I know you've learned a lot of your, you know, you're sort of an unusual character. I mean, a lot of people... You know, they either specialize in, in faith, teaching the gospel, or they specialize in business. I know a lot of our full gospel businessmen and women, I mean, we do both, sort of like you do. So I, I admire you for blending that in. I think there's a lot of uh, examples in God's word uh, or practical examples like building a church is like building a business. It may be the Jesus business instead of uh selling widgets or selling mortgages, but tell us a little bit how, how you can combine your faith with business and be successful, uh, whatever business that you're in. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's a very good question. And um, I, I remember somebody posed a question to Gordon Lindsay where he writes about it. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with that name back from the healing days. And uh, I think it's something that people need to be careful of their calling. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, we had, we had kings and we had priests. And the priest predominantly had the spiritual calling. The king predominantly had the economic calling. And so I do believe that in most cases, uh, well, in all cases, it's important to stay in the lane that we have been called in. But there are cases. Daniel, he did both. He, he ran a country and he was a prophet at the same time. Uh, Joseph, he dreamed, dreamt dreams and he was a spiritual influence as well as a political and economic influence in, in Egypt. So there are definitely cases where somebody is called to do both. And if somebody is called to do both, then it's important to embrace the fullness of that calling. Now, the Nor Norway where I grew up uh, about 200 years ago, it was the poorest country in all of Europe. In fact, it was much poorer than what most of Africa is today. A um, lot of corruption, a lot of evil. I'm sure many of us have heard Viking stories, so it's, it's not all good stories in the history there. Well, this, this one preacher, he ministered for about seven years. And he saw the poverty and, um, you know, we talk about the Sousa Street, but really he was, he was spirit filled even before Sousa Street. He traveled around the country as a lay preacher, illegal. Only a priest sanctioned by the state church was allowed to preach, but he would travel the country as a lay minister. He would preach and he brought a revival very similar to the first and second great awakening here in the United States. But everywhere he went, when people got born again, he, he got them together, helped them pool resources, and those resources became a startup fund for a business. 
And so he would start a church and a business everywhere he went. And he would really instill business ethics. And in the international business community today, uh, Norwegian business ethics is known to be some of the highest ethics. Um, one of my board members, his, his neighbor, is he owns ships in the ocean. And Norwegian owners own about 30% of the ocean's uh, shipping fleet. So it's a major industry in the country. Well, he needed a new ship. And so he called the yard and say, hey, I need a new ship of the same one that you built last time. Can you build that for me? Just a phone conversation. They said yes. They ordered the materials, millions of dollars, no signed contract. Months passed, and this is just a few years ago. Months are passing, and the ship is being built, and months later he goes and visits the yard, and the ship is being built according to specs, and not one single piece of paper has been signed yet. There is not a lot of places around the world that, that you can do business on just a verbal agreement like that. Uh, today, the per capita income in Norway is top 10 in the world. And even secular historians in the country, they attribute and they say, this preacher that I'm talking to you about is the most influential person in the history of the country because he changed the ethics through preaching of the gospel people got born again but he changed the whole economic situation also by that combination and so that's been a great example to me how we as as ministers and as business people we should very much have a very strong mentality of what we do is to impact society and help expand the kingdom of God. Everything we touch us, everywhere we go, you know, if you're selling a mortgage, you're helping somebody get into a home. Well, that's one way of helping somebody. You make some money, and with that money, you can help somebody else as well. So, you know, you, and then you have employees, so you're helping employees as well. You're helping people so many different ways when you're doing business. And so business is, it should be a God-fearing thing. It's, it's a good thing. And we should look upon that as a, as a calling just as much as somebody is who, who's in the pulpit. You know, I, I'd like to ask some advice because we know, I know Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship on, on the board of directors. And we have a lot of uh, older gentlemen that have been involved. I've been involved 40 years. I mean, as I was a young uh, president and, Enid, Oklahoma, back 40 years ago. And now, you know, so I've been around a while, but a lot of my friends have retired and they think life is over. And so can you give us a little bit of a coaching or uh, some of your experience? I mean, you know, I think uh, God is showing me that, that uh, you know, God's not through with us, even if we get into our 60s or 70s. What, what can we do for the kingdom? What, what would you suggest, uh, you know, how we can finish strong, I guess? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I don't know the workings of the full gospel businessmen well enough that I can give, you know, specific strategic advice. But I do know that everything starts with vision. And unless we have a, a, a vision of the future, not just seeing what might be or what ought to be, but the vision becomes so strong that it must be. So that it becomes a drive that that which I'm seeing in the future, it has to come to pass. Uh, so strong that it starts driving not just my wish list, but it starts driving my actions. You know, dreams never come to pass unless there is some action somewhere. And the only way that those actions are sustainable that I know of is there must be some passion there. Otherwise, it'll just fizzle out after a few months' time. Um, no, it's strategy. You know, you see a lot of organizations that, um, 
well, let me use one example. So a lot of the large ministries in the country, they were built maybe on radio, maybe on books, um, maybe on magazines. Well, in those cases, you need to ask, what is the media medium that the younger generation is consuming today? You don't find them in front of the television screen that much, and you don't find them reading that much. But you do find podcasts, you do find YouTube. And so if you're going to build a large ministry today, I think that's going to be difficult if you're not having any kind of a presence uh, blogs are starting to get outdated a little bit in the in the 2000s up to 2010 maybe 2015 blogs were big but you know it's podcasts that that is starting today but I, it also seems to me that you know when it comes to some of these marketing principles it's so much easier for a younger generation to stay abreast with what's going on they have so much more upholds on what the younger generation likes. So at some point, you know, churches where a lot of people, you know, I know of churches where maybe 50% of the membership is, is retired. Well, and such a church needs to ask themselves, you know, what, where did we go wrong in, in reaching the younger generation? Or maybe not so much pointing fingers as to where did we go wrong, but ask the question, how can we better reach the younger generation? So ask younger business people today, what kind of fellowship are they looking for? And I think that when I travel around the world, I find more and more people that are looking for coaching. They're looking for a mentor. And I think 30, 40 years ago, we had more people that were a little bit more pioneers. Just give it to me, I'll go figure it out myself. I don't think you have quite as much of that anymore. You have more people that are, that they want mentorship. They want to be a coach. Um, and if you have retired people, they still have the knowledge. They may not, you know, necessarily have the drive to start a new business from scratch, but Hey, can you mentor three, four, five people that are younger and have the drive, but they need a little bit of help. They need a little bit of accountability. They need a little bit of, you know, what do you do in this particular case? Oh, I ran into a million dollar litigation case. Who is somebody who can help me, guide me through that so I can sleep at night because I got somebody who's, who's kind of holding my hand. Um, I think those are some needs that, that younger business people might have. And I also see a lot of young business people that are, you know, they're, they're, they're looking to build a financial empire for themselves. They need some coaching and some help on, on business-minded business principles, that this is all for a particular purpose. And so if we can find ways to engage them um, in a format that would be intriguing to them, I think it's going to be hard to meet on 3 p.m. young business people, and they have kids in the evening, so you need to ask, you know, when is a good time for them to meet? I think for a lot of them, it might be a 7 a.m. breakfast, uh, maybe could be different in Phoenix. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to raise some questions and hopefully spur a little bit of thinking. That's good. Good. Tell us a little bit about your new book. Uh, I've just started reading it and uh, you know, it's got some great subject matter and uh, you know, and I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your book and how can people join up with your ministry and help you, uh, you know, get the word out, you know, to Kenya and, and to Congo and, you know, other areas. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, you know, charismatic, there's a lot of prosperity teaching and a lot of the teaching centers around uh, the giving and receiving side, which there's a biblical truth there. But I see so many people that are frustrated uh, because they don't understand the action part, the practical action. Um, you need to be putting your hand to something. And so the book is, is meant to take a lot of the principles that we find in Proverbs. Go to the ant of sluggard. Because the ant doesn't need a leader over them. He's, he's self-driven. And he will get up early, be busy about being productive. 
And so it's a lot of practical scriptural, but practical principles. It's things like, how do you take a dream, which could be big and vague, how do you make it specific, turn it into a goal? How do you take that goal and make a plan? And how do you take a plan and you break it up into bite-sized chunks so that every single week you're working on something that relates to the dream that we have? We all have 24 hours, but it's so easy to get into a rut where you just keep on doing the same thing every single day. And then you look back at what we accomplished yesterday and I go, I did stuff, but... I spend 10 hours and maybe only 15 minutes on stuff that really relates to the dreams that I have. So how can we make adjustments in those areas? Uh, A lot of those things are in the book. Uh, A fork in the road, um, choose poverty or prosperity. It's available on Amazon, on Kindle. And then our website is safarimission.org. That's safarimission.org. You can read a lot more about our ministry. Uh, You can see a lot of the testimonies, both from Kenya and also from partners that are involved with us. And then one thing that we do is we have what we call a give back program. Um, So many consumers today, especially um, younger generation, they're looking for businesses that are involved in helping the community in some fashion. And so businesses that partner with us we help them with website language, with sales materials, putting together language for a give back program so that your customers and consumers can see that you're involved in the community. We also help, um, we do morning meetings with employees and help employees understand, hey, if you're selling mortgages here, that's great. You're helping people get into homes, but You're also helping the gospel go forth over in Africa. You're helping people get out of poverty. You're helping to train leaders and you're helping to bring build entrepreneurs as you're selling mortgages. So we help with that communication. So if somebody is interested in something like that, um, reach out to us on safariemission.org. You can contact us there and we'll be more than happy to help you set up something like that. What, um, what are your goals as far as like money that you need to raise to do what you need to do like this next year? We, we have some uh, powerful um, prayer warriors here that are online as well as that are going to be watching this on YouTube. What, what, can, what can we pray with you and for you about? Yeah, so, so expansion into Uganda and Congo is, is definitely some prayer points. A lot of challenges in Congo with infrastructure, with safety, with team members. I've got a phenomenal team of 15 people, um, highly qualified ministers. Um, some of the top national witch doctors in Kenya have been saved through ministry of these people. These are the kind that you want to send into Congo, someplace like this. Uh, we're planning seven trips into Congo next year, and we're we're very careful in the financial side. So I'm able to send a whole team into Congo uh, for about five thousand dollars from from Kenya. It's a thirty hour drive. You need to have the right equipment to be able to go in there. So that there are some expenses, but seven of those trips, um, five thousand dollars each. You know, thirty five thousand dollars, and I can send seven team trips into Congo. Um, so it's, it's, it's effective use of money, um, I believe. Uh, but I would, we would really appreciate prayers for this, for this project. There's not a lot of ministries that do go into Congo just because of the challenges in there. But uh, we believe that the Lord has called us to go in and, uh, and help people find Jesus and help the economic situation in Congo. So we would really appreciate prayer along those lines. Yes. Can, can you pray for, uh, for us as well as the people that are going to see this, the anointing, and, and just pray for us and our fellowship. And, uh, and we really you know, appreciate you coming on, and, and we're really going to stand behind you. I mean, uh, you're, you're the kind of work that I, you know, I, I endorse 100%, and I hope we can get, get to the next level and maybe do some coaching together and 
some planning and uh, and vision, creating a vision. Because I think the you know there's so much opportunity out here. We don't want to miss it and let life pass us by and then uh, miss the opportunities available. So yeah, if you would close us in prayer. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Now, Father, I pray for all this uh, full gospel businessmen, businesswomen in this Phoenix chapter and beyond, Father, for the leadership here. And Father, we ask for wisdom and understanding, spiritual wisdom, spiritual understanding, the hope to which you've called us, the inheritance as it is ours, and the power that is at work within us, that same power that raised Christ from the dead, that we will see that. And Father, an understanding of your will, the calling that you have for us. And Father, we ask for God-given ideas, business ideas, business opportunities, that each and every one will see the opportunities. And Father, also the vision that you have for everybody, both when it comes to business and also when it comes to ministry. Father, we ask for your mercy, for your grace, for your favor, for your hand to be upon each and every one. And the power to go into the business world, to go into every man's world, to go into the whole world with the gospel, with the truth of prosperity, with the truth of the light and the life of God. For Jesus, you did come that we should have life and have it abundantly. So help us all to be ambassadors, to be your mouthpieces, to be your vessels, that each one of us take the place you've called us to, that we can work together to further your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.